Hello everyone. Today we talk about the revival of trade in high medieval Europe. As you know, we have made several videos about this topic already, but never quite uh, addressed at least in a kind of a simple and um, clear uh, way. What were the major routes, especially of trade? Um, du during this time, and what which channels they they, they correspond to? Hmm? Latitudinally speaking, there were different <coughs> directions and paths, as a matter of fact. So today we talk very very simply, and I think relatively briefly, as well about this. Hmm? So we have seen how essentially uh, high medieval period is uh, very underrated overall because we fundamentally attribute chiefly to the 11th and 13th century, which is what we will essentially talk about today, ironically. Um, the <coughs> moment of actual revival by itself, but as we know, not even during early medieval times, of course, trade ever stopped. Um, trade has always gone like transcontinental trade between Europe and, I don't know, East Asia has always been there, right? There's never been any event, uh, not even progressive or kind of more sudden like respectively, I don't know, the, the contraction of um, demographics with the great Justinian epidemics or the Islamic invasions that actually brought an end to trade. Uh, on the contrary, actually, <coughs> and there was a partial um, redynamicization of certain especially productive activities because of the political fragmentation that uh, had ensued um, from the essentially the the collapse of the Roman unity um, of the Mediterranean right with the Islamic invasions um, it's a complicated topic that takes into consideration the fact that objectively smaller <coughs> governments <coughs> excuse me are generally more competitive under certain point of view um, about their economics, right? You know, part of the, even of the success of early mid modern European economy that grew exponentially in a way that was that that was different. Like it was not just growth, as we always say, but expansion, which which started actually it started during the Middle Ages, right? And it started partly thanks to the political fragmentation, because first of all, every um, let's say polity was kind of more um more pressed more uh interested and invested kind of more profitably um in its own economy right than large empires that kind of a, had a, a more let's say a flatter economy or less dynamism right and this is um, objectively uh, you you can't see it in certain particular contexts look for example at what the Byzantine empire was starting from the 12th century onwards, especially compared to, to Western Europe, right? You know, in Western Europe there wasn't de facto um, such a political unity like the, the the Byzantine one, like it was the Holy Roman Empire, but it was just more like a set of principalities that uh, periodically, you know, elected this bro this dynasty and managed somewhat to to bring together large uh, large chunks of Europe, but was a very decentralized system. The Byzantine Empire was kind of more centralized, but at the same time it had less economical vitality. And at one point they, they needed Westerners for, for everything, essentially. The Franks for, for, for mer the mercenaries, uh, the Italians for, for trade, that we will also partly see uh, today. And and you realize that even though the West was fragmented, this absolutely didn't correspond to backwardness on the contrary like from from the 12th century onwards especially trade balances shifted in favor of western europe and this speaks for not just for the capabilities of production themselves but also what gravitated around them in terms of fact of production of craftsmanship and eventually also in banking etc so fin in financial power can capacity commercial penetration that was a big deal at this point and as you know at one point westerners take over the Mediterranean. Um, there is really a big inversion that, if you look at it in perspective, is, is, is really impressive, because not even in the ancient world the West ha had that. You know, during ancient times, it was still the Mediterranean and, and, the, and the East that were the most advanced and, uh, and wealthiest and, you know, and centers that emanated wealth and, and well-being. Uh, in medieval times, for the first time, you have essentially Central Europe that starts 
exporting. Like if you, uh, I don't know, for example, the, the Romans imported usually grain from Tunisia, from Egypt. But at this point, it's Italy that exports grain to Tunisia and to Egypt. That we're talking objectively also about some of the uh, most, most fertile areas. Uh, of of uh, of the Mediterranean itself that needed to import grain it was produced in actually also smaller centers in power so there would be an enormous um, uh, let's say perspective we should start forming about this of on, on a far point I didn't insist much on the histor historical importance of this recognition and many of you will think that I'm biased for some reason but uh, I objectively this is something that we're starting to see. Obviously, we don't have to uh, radically magnify as if, you know, that there were s such enormous differences, after all, between certain regions of Europe. But um, I speak for this not much because uh, I speak from a Western perspective, but because, in fact, as Westerners, we actually talk uh, garbage about our own past in, during the medieval times, as if we were just a bunch of primitives, with, you know, of ignorant, superstitious, and whatever, and that we didn't have anything. We, it was actually mainstream uh, historiography is stressing the fact that, uh, you know, it, there is an um, enormous amount of evidence that observes how the, uh, actually, the, the levels of growth and expansion of, of, of Western Europe in, since this even from the the tenth century, even before, we were really impressive, and they were something different from what had been seen before. And they were evolving essentially into a uh, essentially modern and capitalistic mindset that has it would eventually uh, develop further into into especially the modern age, right? And everything has to be um, considered, of course, here. I've given some also approximate definitions because you know capitalism exists um, in, in it all depends on how you want to judge it. Like I'm actually uh, an economically speaking, I'm a full liberist, and um, and therefore I to, to me it doesn't make sense to speak of capitalism in this specific sense. But just for saying that we're certain um, forms of of economical pr of uh, you know. Also, wealth distribution, because this was particularly important as well in, in the European uh, background, let's say, but also of um, essentially of means that were used. We were born from the Middle Ages. We, we in the Middle Ages, we still use today, right? Including uh, paper money, for example, um, or other things like banking as we know it was born there. So even some of the major. Um, uh, exchange letters, for example, you know, they were born in. Th these were some of the greatest inventions in uh, in the history of e economics, right? And and they started from here. So the, the Middle Ages, seen as everything but a flatland where there was scarce economical competitive uh, competition, or, and or I don't know, a stagnating economy. Medieval civilization is the apex of mercantilism in, in many ways. So uh, aside from this. And this is important to frame today's topic in the sense that today we will observe mostly how this began in the centuries uh, to assume forms that were starting to be really imposing. Uh, if anything, from volume of traffic and and also accumulated wealth, right? So um, a lot, um, you know, to do with this has to do naturally with local production. All of this was based essentially on an agricultural system. But at a certain point, thanks to the development of craftsmanship, that reveals the presence of a surplus, so a higher crop rate of some some kind, or however, also mm, different types of economical of, of production organization, right, of which the feudal civilization was able to build. Like also, again, we say, oh, well, we, we distinguish between the feudalism and, I don't know, the entrepreneurial city-states of as something different. Well, actually, they went in parallel with this, and feudalism proper was very far from being, like, the, the equivalent of a latifundium economy or whatever. It was actually uh, an incredible mo mover and motor of, of, of all this that put set everything in motion, 
and that rationalized production, organized it better, better than what, but this went at the loss of freedom of individuals, of course, but at the same time it organized it better, uh, which is a kind of a controversial lesson that we can in part learn from this, um, because it's still from this that com came our, this world that came our, uh, you know, uh, political theories about democracy, about freedom, etc. So we shouldn't be too negative about the, especially we should focus the, on the reasons why feudalism developed, first of all, the, which is not um, a, an imposition interpreted kind of in a classist sense. Uh, it was very much more complicated. It was really, especially at the beginning, a real s kind of paritary social contract. Uh, the peasantry had needed this forms of protection and of organization of work and only eventually you know there was a real oppression sure and exploitation and but that's something also that crumbled with the bourgeois uh, revolution of the uh, of the 18th century even before in England in the 17th that um, that uh, were essentially the product as middle classes of even clear wealth that had been produced in those same countries um, ruled by the, the ancien regime, right? So, we have made many, many videos about, if you go into, into the medieval society playlist, that's where we talk all about the, 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 the economical side of this story, so we won't be, and also the development of feudalism, so if you're interested, maybe it's better if you go check there, because that, that's the, you can find better, the best answers without me repeating them all the time. Um, and we will talk surely further about that specific topic. But um, definitely craftsmanship is very important. That's also where the, the, the merchant guilds or corporations, whatever you want to call them, would emerge. And this have to be seen not much like movers by themselves. Like, of course, they were you know actively uh, producing wealth, etc. But uh, Pierre's thesis, according to which you know, one day you know the European economy revived because this of these courageous merchants that first and foremost abandoned the uh, the feudal world and they started trading. Well, no, uh, as we were saying before, it was the feudal system that needed these agents to move stuff or uh, to to make traffic alive, to move goods around, and um, and also how craftsmanship um, developed, right? And um, the, um, the there was an intensification of exchanges that naturally went in parallel, and it never ended. Also, understanding the Mediterranean perspective here is fundamental, because we have a kind of a stereotypical and gloomy picture that we model chiefly, and erroneously in part, also in the nor northern Europe. Right? You know, not all Europe was the same. The Mediterranean was already substantially way more advanced uh, in the same Christian countries um, and of course also in the Islamic ones and, and that's from where most of this change began like eventually Northern Europe had a great importance in the sense that it grew in proportion much faster than the South that right? was already very wealthy and kept growing consistently at this time but also the, the North kind of uh, towards during the, the low medieval centuries, kind of closed the gap, frankly, fast, right? In par at least in certain contexts, especially countries like, I don't know, Germany or England and whatever, that were quite, starting to be quite productive um, towards the end of the Middle Ages. Um, and the, the, there are naturally many, uh, I'm using many approximations to more or less give some coordinates about the whole picture, but naturally everything is way more complicated. But the, inc the intensification of exchanges, in this sense, can be interpreted definitely not just as a Western European thing. Uh, it was happening all, all over, right? Um, and the, the the Byzantine world was was expanding. It was was expanding and growing uh, as well. The Byzantine world was big in, in the middle. The Islamic world was um, growing more uh, more than expanding at this point actually from the 11th century the Islamic world undergoes a moment of, of, of if anything of political crisis and fragmentation that doesn't have the same outcomes in Western Europe uh, for reasons that now we can't explain I made a video at one point comparing Carolingian uh, Europe with um, the Abbasid Caliphate from this political social economical point of view let's say that the um, the the Muslim cities of the Mediterranean never achieved the same level of 
commercial competitiveness than the ones of I don't know of of, of Italy or Catalonia or, or whatever. Where the, in fact the maritime republics would take over the Mediterranean traffics, and being also the, the best partners of the Muslims at some point because they they control the Muslims in turn controlled all the traffics from the from the east, whether they came from the Silk Road or uh, the Red Sea. Uh, and, and for the Indian Ocean, so uh, this this trade is very important because th these things will would go on, like even the uh, during early modern times, there were certain routes that had been formed in 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 medieval times that uh, were struggling to remain alive. For example, think about the relations between Venice and uh, and the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, they, they were at war uh, fiercely. Uh, on some occasions, that they needed to trade. However, in, in peacetime, and they all had the um, the interest that uh, the Iberians wouldn't open the uh, let's say the the, the African uh, and route for the Indian Ocean because they 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 feared they would lose what they could gain from the land route throughout uh, through continental Asia. So it's all very um fascinating and we would have to start maybe talking at one point also about modern history um to clarify a little bit this thing in in a longer perspective but it's obvious that during the 11th and 13th century this great growth brought into motion a lot of goods from all, all over across Eurasia uh, and beyond that um articulated and consolidated uh, both thanks to the uh, new dynamics in relation between city and countryside and slash uh, urban uh, and rural markets and both and and the mm, commerce at middle and long um, range right and this is important because the especially in, in western europe uh, the the cities would become um, capable, in fact, not just of being passive um, kind of market centers that would leave out of the tolls, etc., but also of kind of literally expanding and seizing certain trade posts and controls, right? Think about all the uh, Italian quarters in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in every city that sometimes they literally controlled all the access to the sea because they, they, they had a, a city within the city that also was quite difficult to to take without without a fleet that these republics actually had um so you you understand here that these were systems that were essentially consolidating uh, a larger structure than just like i don't know uh, market infrastructures right they were literally and you know shifting all the good as well you know this was um important to of course be competitive also in the european um market squares etc and and this also developed in turn the same uh, European continental routes for that from the Mediterranean arrived up to you know, the, the Central Europe and, and the North. Um, that in turn were expanding on their own regard and finding uh, as well by themselves similar similar ways. The Anseatic League being perhaps the most famous um, uh, trade organization, of course, uh, I mean perhaps surely <laughs> in the north of Europe. Um, that instead um, that had its own Mediterranean in the north be between the, the the North Sea and and the Baltic Sea that connected uh, even there with Europe with Asia since Viking times, right? So um, uh, the Mediterranean perspective is, is somewhat overlooked in this sense, uh, but it had always been there, and this is often very very uh, overlooked uh, for real in the sense that historiographically speaking, there is not much of a uh, great attention outside of certain peculiar, uh, of course, countries' perspectives, but uh, it should be like one elementary, solid piece of information for understanding a uh, great part of medieval history, otherwise it doesn't quite make sense. Um, so, uh, certain commercial paths um, bypassed the um, local and regional dimension it came to interest um in in some case even since the the early uh the the, the, the early phase let's say the first post carolingian phase um much wider territories right we're talking about literally transcontinental contacts hmm? and uh, 
moving from Europe um, in let's say northwestern Europe and fr and from Scandinavia, the Swedes and the Norwegian and and the Danish penetrated <coughs> deeply into the eastern steppes, up to beyond the Caspian Sea, right, which is actually a lake. Um, but just for saying that they were reaching essentially the Silk Road, right, in today's uh, Kazakhstan. And so they were working essentially as a joint between the commercial uh, flows coming from the east uh, and, and, and the west, right? And especially uh, these ones were to be, um, you know, the, 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 there was a revolving area, let's say, that is often overlooked as well, uh, which is the, probably the, the English and Anglo-Norman, we could say, one. Right, the fact that actually the Normans, through their contacts from Normandy uh, around uh, the whole Mediterranean and the north, um, um, they had uh, an opportunity to to control very important uh, stopping points of this great trade routes, and there are great contacts, in fact, between same England and areas of of uh, broader areas, in, and uh, up to the Mediterranean, it would last actually very long, right? Um, and naturally, the German merchants also they they had another kind of another path. They fundamentally passed through Central Europe, um, and they would ex keep expanding. Let the other day we were making this video about the Germ Germanic expansion towards the east. Um, that also is not to be given for granted because we mostly think about the Anseatically, but, but actually, it was a properly German traffic passing. Uh, through Central Europe, because actually the Silk Road arrived, at least one of these uh, of its m multiple branches, passed through the Danube, the exterior of the Danubian, um, uh, of the, the Danube, and um, and therefore in today's Romania substantially, and and the Germans were to expand there, and a great um, turning point in this was the defeat of the Hungars at the hands uh, of the Ottonians, that basically. Uh, neutralized the military threat posed by the Hungers, who also settled down, they became kind of a, um, a fully sanitarized kingdom based in part chiefly on the Frankish models but also on the Byzantine ones and that facilitated in fact the trade routes as you know the Hungers before had essentially carried out a kind of a raiding economy right and also put in crisis the central Europe with these continuous raids and kind of crippling uh, commerce and whatever so from from the seas th this this problem you know especially along the Danube there was this expansion that we can see towards areas like uh, Pannonia the Pannonian plain and and Bohemia as well that was uh, being inserted also in this broader traffic these were areas that saw also a lot of German colonization that helped also to revitalize economy um, in fact, was quite welcomed, especially by the local uh, kings, um, and that essentially can be interpreted also politically as a great uh, participation to broad international trades. Like it was all the the interest for, the, for this systems aside from other strategic reasons that are particularly evident in in the case of Hungary. Uh, but if you think about Bohemia, for example, that you know was historically kind of a you know, uh, an en not necessarily an enemy of the of, of the German area, but you know the, the the attrition on on the central European frontier between the Frankish world and the Slavs uh, had been a real thing. Well, Bohemia gets fully integrated first as a duchy and then as a kingdom within the same Holy Roman Empire and w with uh, with a recognized uh, title uh, with, with very high feudal uh, authority in that sense and um and in fact bohemia would evolve also in the in the 13th century a great power and in the 14th as well as actually uh, one of the most important um definitely the most important cultural center in the 14th century in europe um in terms of at least a feudal direction um uh, as a single let's say state but also an important um econ center of economy uh, in, in the heart of Europe. Um, so these perspectives are important because th these are fair, very overlooked uh, after all, uh, more than maybe 
needing just a Mediterranean perspective, we also need a Central European perspective, which is often kind of dismissed, right? Um, and looking a bit southeast, um, it's obvious that if you look at Constantinople, uh, the Near East, or Egypt, um, and even in Tunisia, um, you realize that in, in this high medieval centuries, the since the the tenth century, frankly, the Italian merchants uh, coming chiefly from from Amalfi and Venice uh, started having a great impact on local economy and essentially monopolizing uh, the uh, international commerce, right? And between uh, and also you know connecting further. Western Europe with the Byzantine and Muslim world, um, economically and culturally, etc. And the the very first, um, you know, expansion started from from the south of Italy with, with Amalfi, right? That, uh, however, with the Norman conquest, so a decline because the Normans brought um, uh, uh, essentially feudal. Uh, structure in the system that choked this uh, cities as such. So it's not that actually the Sicilian Norman kingdom was was poor. Actually, it was very florid um, for for a couple of, of centuries. I mean, it remained uh, impressive. And even later, actually, it was a major um, economical power in Europe. But um, it uh, it lost its m more likely its um, expansive capacity, like this cities had. And in fact, if you look at Venice, well, that, that's wh what it makes you the, uh, realize how how far and powerful this commercial uh, power could could actually be. And Venice had emerged, and what what is more striking about Venice is that it, it, it didn't exist like a city at the beginning, like Amalfi or other centers like eventually Genoa or Pisa were actually cities since quite a, quite a, some time. Venice was built over the, the lagoons, right? Um, and of course, it was an area settled since the prehistory. Like, uh, but um, the city as we know it today was being developed here at, at an incredibly fast rate. Um, probably some of the fastest, in, urbanistically speaking, in the whole of European history of the time. And the, um, the this center had acquired a great autonomy ever since. Like, it, first of all, it was technically part of the Byzantine Empire, right? Uh, these were local communities that had kind of the, 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 their own Byzantine officers, and theoretically depending on Constantinople. But from the ninth century, you see that Venice starts dealing uh, with, for example, the Byzantine Empire and even the Carolingian Empire autonomously. Uh, chiefly for for economical reasons, also because these empires needed uh, this city to to uh, naturally to control their own trade. Right, the Carolingians were quite. They, they tried actually. The Carolingians even tried to conquer Venice. Instead, they 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 failed miserably. Even Charlemagne's son died of malaria in the Venetian lagoons during the campaign. And um, there was a a moment of uh, it, it Venice would maintain this this role essentially for for all of its history like this until modernity wouldn't would render its power obsolete. Let's say that at the end of the of the 18th century, as you know, Napoleon conquered it and passed this to the uh, to Austria uh, eventually. Um, but up to that point, Venice had lived just of its commercial wealth, right? Uh, they had been engaged in terrestrial um, affairs just because of necessity, not because it was interested. These cities were interested exclusively in trade, right? And and that's what all their perspective was, especially these maritime republics. Now, the deal of these cities was very important because Venice and also as its... Um, uh, ancient rival Comacchio basically controlled the Po River traffic. Now, the Po River at this point, um, you know, that Sizzlepin Gaul, northern Italy, in ancient times weren't very developed areas. Like, they, they had seen, of course, uh, Roman urbanization and whatever, but in order, like, they, the, the importance that it would acquire in the early and uh, high middle ages actually was, was a striking. 
uh, the Pont Valley became this great joint, in fact, between the Mediterranean and Central Europe. Um, this area is at the mouth of, of the river were also full of salt. It was extremely important at the time for preserving food and, and implementing further the same trade as a consequence because, of course, you could um, preserve food for kind of longer travels if you, if you had salt or other or spices or something like that, which incidentally also spices were imported from the east by this city, so that they very often had even the same European monopoly of the spice trade, um, and, um, and and that's the reason why it developed so fast. Also, with a commercial aggressiveness that was striking, right? This traffic uh, sealed from um, Pavia was the ancient Longobard capital, and uh, arrived there, and um, and very soon Venice managed to to invest this surplus to, to expand further, to crush um, Slavic piracy in the Adriatic, to, to strengthen the control uh, on the trade routes with, with the East and intensifying it and actually starting to trade, even with people they had nothing to do with, that were the Egyptians, for example, and both the Byzantines and the Papacy said, what the hell are you doing? Those are, <laughs> you know, Muslims. You don't sell weapons or slaves or timber to them because and Venice rightfully didn't give a damn, and <laughs> then it kept doing it anyway. So uh, this this is very precocious because we we don't know about the the actual origins, or at least not very documented. But we see that uh, at the turn of the eleventh century, that, that that Venice traffics were already so developed that you have to realize that it has all had all started before, and therefore the fact that we don't have a direct evidence shouldn't make us think that. The development occurred later when, in fact, it was already consolidated by the time. Um, so what happened before in this centuries needs a lot more of attention than it's been given up up to, to, to now. Um, and, uh, and But naturally, the, the, the most important trade partner with Venice was, was the Byzantine Empire, within which he, the, the same Venice, as we have recalled, had emerged herself. So, um, technically, what made uh, Venice so so prosper, especially at the beginning, were the special privileges that she had for trade with Constantinople. Um, right, the, in, in 993, um, Venice was exempt from, from tolls, for example, um, uh, because of Emperor Basil II's uh, decision, and this was recognizing the fact of the the already uh, quite functional uh, trade uh, system, let's say that Venice had the commerce system that Venice had put uh, uh, in standing right, uh, at this point, and eventually there is a sanction less than one century later with the Chrysobulla, right, the Golden Bull, by Alexis Comnenus in 1082 that um, this f extended essentially the further and more generally the uh, the possibilities of uh, the city of St. Mark um, within the marketplaces of, of the empire, right? And, and, and this opened to Venice the path for hegemony in the um, commerces with, with the East, right? Um, another very important area uh, in the Mediterranean is Catalonia, in northeastern I Iberia, and um, this this is also very overlooked, just like the, the one of southern and western France in general, because these basically were areas of frontier with the Muslim world, right? And um, that you know Catalonia had very closely available the Muslim gold. And uh, this allowed uh, the uh, the Catalonian uh, trade centers to uh, receive, um, uh, say, to increase the re receptive capacities of their own markets. Um, that, in fact, was flooded with um, with silk, brocades, jewelry, um, textiles, all stuff that was coming from the Caliphate. Right, so these were the first, like even paper, for example, passed from here. Uh, a lot of technological and 
intellectual uh, wealth uh, and, and assets, say, were acquired by the Europeans through this northern Iberian contact. Um, and, and, and this routes passed, in fact, uh, through the, uh, the, the, the Pyrenees, and they arrived to the uh, Occitan cities of Toulouse, Narbonne, also uh, up to north in uh, Limoges, and another and other centers that eventually in turn were connected with I don't know in fact northern France the Champagne fairs um, and, and therefore uh, you understand how this net was was expanding progressively and and more than intensifying I think a beautiful plastic visual mm, picture is uh, is thinking of all these veins that get you know you know strengthened at the start into which blood starts being pumped like and, and they 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 extend they expand uh, but th it's as if they had always been there right um and um the there are naturally great changes over time this was not a linear transformation there were certain countries uh, that kind of had it better before uh, and declined later and and vice versa others that maintained to you know that their first place others that started developing would become the end of the middle ages as some very important market centers there were new cities founded new um new new routes open like many cities were founded thanks to this the, the opening of certain routes right and they, they eventually ousted maybe other centers that had paradoxically um granted its uh triggered its, its development right uh, the 12th century is particularly important um, in this process because um, it's a moment in which a lot of um, paths and routes are, are expanded. Uh, especially in the north, if you look at this ancient connection that from the uh, from from north of Europe brought into the steppes of Asia, um, you see that mm, th there was. Um, an enormous expansion of of trade connections of communications right between the the channel the north sea we're talking especially about trade of metals um and um actually english metals and, and wool and they they started reaching from their continental europe and here the um in fr in front of this um in intensification the traffics um, and the intensification of traffics areas like uh, and also rivers very importantly rivers think about the Mons, um the the Somme right um, Picardy um, the, these were all centers were developing a lot especially thanks to these mm, imports of of, of uh, raw material from the British um, especially especially from England telling the truth. But not only um, that were worked locally. Um, think about well, we talked about it a lot: the textiles from Flanders and of uh, uh, Artois. They, they started being exported in ever wider uh, markets. And in, in the 12th century, the uh, Flemish uh, 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 clothes, the textiles, Im invaded, for example, the the major German markets. And they started uh, to be massively, uh, to take massively the the, the road to towards the south uh, as well. And starting from the 12th century, also acquired uh, bigger in the Baltic the initiative of the German merchants that knew how to to advance, um, essentially uh, taking away from the Danish probably uh, properly the. Uh, this this first role, um, especially the foundation of Lübeck in 1143, it represents the the salient moment of this um, mercantile epopee. Because as you know, Lübeck, and being the founder m and most important center of the Hanseatic League, um, and um, so this th this was a sort of um, of state essentially emerging, like with all the, the the obvious distinctions, but the, the commercial capacity of the Anseatic League was superior, for example, to the one of uh, I don't know of, of 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 kingdoms. Sometimes it could be um, that they blackmailed saying kingdoms, like if you don't let our 
merchants some of our cities trade you know we will block you trade for, for, forever and, you know even in kingdoms as powerful as the one of England were forced essentially to to do this also because for example England had enormous interests um with the Rhine um uh, uh, routes uh, the Rhine valley with Saxony so they needed also to to support this this uh, merchants that could could otherwise um, block the, the same trade because they were actually also naval power on their own. Um, and uh, if we look again at um, I Iberia, um, we see here in the 12th century the diminishment of the afflux of, of, of gold from the Muslim south towards Catalonia, but were um dynamized uh, during the same time the traffics um connected to the coastal navigation and also the shipyard activities and particular the one uh, the ones of Barcelona that would rise as one of the most important um trade and kind of naval center in in the western mediterranean uh, and eventually that would have started to expand further in the 13th century and the 14th century even towards Italy um, and uh, so uh, in fact also in Italy in the 12th century the situation was pretty pretty dynamic the, um, the after the, the first crusade especially the uh, the peasants had acquired uh, a great um, uh, importance um, thanks to the strongholds that they were entrusted to them right you know that the peasants were the ones that shipped uh, like that kept the control of the uh, supply lines by sea for the crusaders Jerusalem was stormed because the peasants basically cut down the, their own ships and in order to make um, a siege uh, machinery like siege towers to storm the city um, Godfrey of Bouillon even entitled like said all oh, the that Jerusalem was, you know, taken tanks to the Pisa, and the the the, the Pisa was a particular maritime republic because it, uh, differently from others, al had also land interests, but not abroad, rather in into Italy. Um, outside, it had kind of similar similar interests, but um, it was a maritime republic. For example, expanded in Sardinia as well territorially, where there were silver. Um, mines where they, they started exploiting the local resources they would lose that to the Aragonese at the beginning of the 14th century and um, eventually and it, it, the peasants at this point got lots of um, of in fact of, of quarters in some of the major cities of the Near East um, all uh, crusader centers at this point Antioch, uh, Tyre, Acre all right and in um there was also a you know the privileges granted by uh John Comnenus uh to the further to the um uh, to the to the peasants also in their own land they were not very different from the ones granted by the Byzantines to to the Venetian themselves so there was also naturally attrition by the same Italians that every once in a while caused some you know mass like a battle between you know I don't know the peasants and Venetians for which at one point the Byzantines also got fed up they caused a massacre of some of the, the sides and the and this, the, the, the Italians also kind of responded it, it was a a mess right in in this sense in fact the Byzantines were notoriously xenophobic in their attitude towards the, the Latins especially and they uh, the, but they they re they were re this contrast actually uh, proves the fact that the the, the the empire couldn't do without these merchants because the action the same for the Muslims right because the, the the Italians were in Egypt as well and the the concept was that if you like okay these these guys uh, you don't like them because they're foreigners they're thinking just about themselves um, but without them you can't access the best markets around right so you need money the, this powers, these empires, these sultanates and whatever, were all about the, the, they didn't have enough money, chronically right, so th these guys were the only ones that you know, could make you cash a lot um, 
but they also wanted their own benefits in, in this. And in fact, what is interesting about the Italians is that they um, they were mm, largely responsible for the success of the same Crusader states for some time. It also when uh, eventually the Muslims managed to 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 take uh, the, the Ottoman states out, the Italians kept being there, and, and they kept trading as if nothing had happened, right? So this continuity actually proves the um, the the commercial strength of these powers. Like they they were able to basically withstand any 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 shock. In fact, what, what is what is interesting and very very meaningful, for example, when the Venetians and the French captured Constantinople. Well, uh, the first thing, technically, the Venetians, uh, first of all, you know that from the um, uh, the crusade, from, from the third crusade onwards, everything was gone by, was done by by ship, like the, in the first crusade, everybody took the land r route. Uh, by the third century, the, thir uh, the third crusade, nobody con could even conceive to go by by land to the Holy Land, uh, so the, the the ships were nearly the Italians were the only ones at this time that had continuously uh, ships at their disposal. Like normally, uh, other kingdoms didn't have anything like this. Like I don't know, uh, that they there were fleets that were recruited every once in a while if there was a specific need for besieging a, a coastal center or whatever. But af after that, they were disbanded. Um, the Italians didn't have like anything like a, a real statal permanent fleet, but they had. It, it's as if they had it because they had continuously like tens and tens of galleys out there. So, if the the the, the commune, the city state, decided that th they were at war, they, they they asked the same oligarchs that were part of the same government, by the way, that had all the interests in the same war, to to give this galleys for for war. Right, so all these this galleys were sh were also the ones that shipped all the Crusaders' expeditions. Uh, the Crusaders didn't have ships on their own, and and so Venice had and with with the French Crusades, uh, Crusaders technically had the um, made this deal that everything they ha they would have conquered during the Fourth Crusade would have gone. I don't remember whether one third or one fourth to the Venetians, in, in terms of land, like of every possession, when they captured Constantinople and the Latin Empire is founded, the Venetians basically leave all the land they, they theoretically could claim, uh, uh, and they take exclusively the ports. The ports, because that was the, all, the cleverest. They were easy to defend, as we've seen it. Uh, they were the real trade centers. And 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 they would not maintain any land garrison aside from the very few people that were enough to to maintain strongholds in the Middle Ages in those areas, and they had the fleet that could replenish, resupply all these centers continuously. So they made the cleverest move. While the Latin Empire, you know, <laughs> is a sort of feudal anarchy, and it was um, it was doomed to to failure, uh, as well as the, the Crusaders. I mean, not maybe doomed, but let's say there is nothing deterministic, but saying that there are different cultural horizons in part, different views of power and of goal. Like, you know, when you think about a feudal state that's a monarchy with with a with a nobility with, with that has the needs to intervene in a certain dimension regularly in war. When you look at these city states, they're essentially merchant republic. Right? That's that's literally what they are. They're mercantile republics, they think just about their money, and that's all they want. Right? Um, they're not real States, uh, as we 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 could, it, but well, okay, not even feudal monarchies are real states, but uh, in the sense that they didn't they didn't conceive the need of expanding further, like a of a broader administrative system on the lands. No, they could even uh, have their own autonomy. The the, the, mo the important thing is that trade worked, right? Um, so another problem for the, another competitor that emerged from Italy at this point was Genoa in Liguria so this power was uh, kind of arrived later compared to Pisa but eventually at the end of the 13th century was able to defeat uh, the Tuscan Maritime Republic and to um, not really to annihilate it because Pisa went on as a kind of a power actually they, they allied themselves at that point with Pisa that so in Genoa, as the, the winner, like the the, be, the, the best um, person to to bet on, to invest their money on. So, 
this progressed like with a further expansion of the Genoese uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, initially, Pisa and Genoa actually had helped to to knock out the Saracen piracy out of the Western Mediterranean. They even participated. They, they even helped the Aragonese to, in fact, to to um, seize certain coastal centers. Um, they had freed the Balearic Islands. They did. There was a lot of of activity uh, between this, but uh, as soon as you know the, the the area was cleared from from the Muslims, they started fighting against each other, which is typical. The same mm, the Iberian powers would do the same uh, by land. You know, after the, the the Battle of Nas Navas, they they would they could have easily taken out the, the last Muslim presence and started fighting with each other. And for other two hundred years, the Muslims remained in Spain, um, and uh, so. It's it's that dynamic, and but it's strongly economical, as a, uh, as a dynamic, right? It, it's it's not about really um, broader questions. It, it's really about how can I make money continuously. And and bear in mind that that, that this was justified in the sense that money was always lacking. So if you really wanted to do anything in terms, even s just civilly, not just militarily speaking, you know, you you had to take into consideration that you had to do something military because of money, right? And there weren't any other ways. It, there was no way to, to escape this system. Uh, it's not a matter that these people were kind of backwards compared to us. It's that that's ne literally what they... the only thing they could do to to improve civilization, even for us to be here uh, at this point. So, uh, there are several contra eventually Genoa would enter in contrast with Venice that also will ally in turn with the Aragonese that would kind of shift trade routes uh, again they would open the Atlantic uh, route I mean the Genoese at that point uh, well it's complicated this pertains mostly to the 14th century we made videos about that, that as well um, but just for saying that this was all about the controlled trade routes and even Theoretically, the creation of shifting or the the already existing ones. In any case, the most intense concept um, tr um, commerce was maintained uh, by the Italians with the Near East, right up to the creation of the Atlantic routes. Uh, the the main uh, the main wealth passed through there in Europe, and and it, it remained like that as well. Of course, there were certain swings also depending. For example, the Mongols opened a lot. The, uh, to the international intercontinental traffics because of their ability to um, you know the, for the fact that the, as a single government they didn't need to put so many tolls as all the various principates that had existed before in the way this would collapse in the 14th century again so a lot of dynamics again that we can't cover now but that should be borne in, in mind when talking about this uh, periods. So, um, but aside from the maritime republics, we don't have to um, underestimate also the great uh, Italian cities of the interland. For example, like Milan, that was at one point the largest city, a city in Europe, also the wealthiest in the 12th century. Um, Bologna as well, also that w was quite quite important, and. Um, and, and and the Italian peninsula maintains this balance between the Europe and the Near East substantially, and um, that would go on for for, for centuries at this point. Um, and uh, the um, this would implement also certain systems of trade. For example, the the mute were particularly important. Um, novel technology was developing in parallel. Um, the um, the Venetians at one point they, they invent this flotilla system that is the, the muda uh, that basically these are like large ship caravans with cargo ships escorted by military galleys they not at this point it was, wasn't quite of a difference yet but you know still it existed and it was about matter of uh, it was a, 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 about defending these convoys, like having larger convoys, not to let the, the smaller ships to be raided by pirates or by concurrent Italian uh, republics. 
and, and this made also, however, naval warfare escalating into larger and actually bloodier conflicts um, at a time, uh, uh, one at a time, uh, as these flotillas would, would also meet and destroy each other. So, what is interesting in the Mediterranean is that, like in other sea and every other sea, but is that there are certain mm, like you can't uh, at this time with now technology you can't stop, uh, you can't control an area of sea, you can intercept most enemies sometimes, but you can still pretend that you block their trade. So what was done, it was a sort of ambush into certain straits um, in certain periods of the year in which you know that, that the winds uh, blew in a certain direction, etc. That increased the chances of, of uh, ambushing the enemy and, um, and pro you know, stealing and seizing its cargoes, etc. So this whole thing developed ever more sophisticated and advanced naval technology the first uh, kind of more scientific um, ge geographical maps are substantially developed in this context between Italy and Catalonia because these were uh, mostly following the, the coastline initially then eventually extending also in representing the uh, the interland uh, and they were pioneered here, together all with the mathematical notions that were being developed with the practices of uh, accounting um, that w in, that were all one with the systems, with banking, with wealth, with culture, with and also what, that's where the Renaissance would, would be born from, essentially. Um, and it all started from these traffics, right, uh, between uh, Europe and this eastern regions of uh, the Byzantine Empire, Egypt, Syria, uh, etc. And, okay, m maybe sometimes we repeat ourselves, because in other videos we, we talked about this stuff as well, but uh, I have the impression that there is um, a conveniency and an importance of taking into consideration certain specific perspectives that can be, uh, let's say, Im important um, to not j like this is all data you can find online in many ways. But the important thing I would say is to to frame them correctly more than anything. Like there is not a um, a great mystery about the single data. The problem is framing them in a kind of a logical sense, like how many people, because th this is the problem I also had at the beginning, right, how do I know, like I, I knew that certain centers had a certain importance, but how to dimension that? We're progressively going a bit further in Schwerpunkt with kind of more kind of precise information. This, is, this was not the case, it was a, still a kind of a generalistic video, but in, on other occasions we started just already also to give a, a quantification to be a bit more um, specific, and that's our future. Like we're we're completing now after two years, essentially. Some of the most important uh, ABCs, let's say, of the uh, just the the parameters uh, around uh, on which uh, a medieval a person would start studying medieval history for the first time can orientate him or herself. Uh, there is much more, right? But it's important to get this first things right, and the rest will come along kind of more easily. And, and that's essentially what we study in universities, like the the, uh, the first year, first um, the first time we, we we address these topics. But we also tend to forget them very easily, right? We pass immediately to the hyper specialized stuff, and we we lose the the most important background, though that is the uh, the compass that we we need instead to the to for for interpreting this broader this broader issues and relatively to trade specifically uh, I think uh, it's like the mo the healthiest way to see this is to to imagine it as, um, as something that in fact had never quite ceased right and not thinking as Thinking it as uh, this, this stuff had has began. Like uh, it actually, it began now at this moment. No, it, it had always existed. It's just that we we saw it with with less ease uh, 
and um, also because there are less sources, the, the picture is less documented, but it doesn't mean that there weren't progresses being done in that previous time. So mm, it's mm, we, we don't have to be to cut everything like sharply. I, I see this being done a lot when you, you talk about the Middle Ages as if, first of all, there's always someone who was kind of the bad guy uh, or, or or the evil guy who did something wrong. Well, no, th there were systems that were basically behaving all in the same way. Um, there are people who were obsessed by kind of culturalist interpretation, but they're, it, it doesn't stand a chance. Also because there was a lot of, as I saw, interpretation, I mean, also because there was really a lot of homogeneity. It's obvious that we prefer to study this in the sense of, okay, let's see the differences so we can't give finally that dimension that we need to interpret it, but still, you you f in order to find, s to spot the differences, you should be able also to realize what, what the, the most concrete base of all this was, that it was much larger in the systems that were uh, pre-industrial, pre, uh, pre, pre, pre right, um, what uh, they... Uh, you know, the fact that they they had all an agricultural system at the base and there wasn't much of a difference after all between the four. But th th there are certain systems though that expand uh, in a particular sense, in a particular way, with particular dynamics, and others that um, have more difficulties in this sense. Um, this is, a, as I was saying at the beginning, sometimes a controversial interpretation like uh we another thing we we should think is that we 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 lack consistently a lot of information about certain countries still like it's not i don't know about uh trade in i don't know in today's turkey for example how it was really like but we don't know it really well even in uh, let's say we don't know it as well as we know it for example for for western europe we know, of course, French trade way better. We know, of course, Spanish trader much better. Why? Well, because you, there, there were better documented errors that were to evolve in certain uh, ways also afterwards that would kind of help to preserve information. But also, th these were systems that had certain specific features already by now that enabled that preserve. Um, preservation. So that's why you you see sometimes these larger powers, and and you think that they were uh, like uh, the most important. But sometimes, sometimes larger powers were, you know, more influent as such, but not really more competitive, um, qualitatively speaking. Th this is very important to understand, uh, and that's why you you can't the way you can interpret sometimes even, I don't know, the fall of Constantinople, um, much b before then the Turks, actually the same crusaders as we've seen today, um, but also the same uh, in modern age, is in the modern age, just, I don't know, the same uh, Ottoman Empire or other powers that had objectively a different background from this mostly... Um, it was a mostly f a system of Frankish origin, right? If we want to use Frankish, not in a, of course, not in an ethnical sense, but when I used Frankish, I I stressed this mostly this Latin Germanic world that was encompassed eventually by the Carolingian Empire, right? And that eventually expanded further with with England, with Sicily, with Scandinavia, with Spain. You know, th 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 there was this Frankization. Of of the of the beyond the, the, the central Europe where the, the system had emerged, and and it's not just about that. Like there are centers, of course, that at this point were extremely competitive and that had be not been part of, for example, the the Frankish Empire, like the first maritime republics in southern Italy, for example. But for example, the one of the Italic Kingdom where they were part of that Frankish system, bro more broadly speaking. So. Um, that's why it, it's 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 important to 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 think about it in those terms. And okay, well, let's not comment further because there are technically other important things we could say, but maybe 
we'll talk about it in another on another occasion. Okay, so for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or sus subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, um, I uh, thank you her heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.